Hi, I'm Amy Catapan. Today we welcome Dr. James Papandrea, who is a teacher, author, speaker, and musician. After graduating from the University of Minnesota with a bachelor's degree in music and theater arts, Jim went on to receive his Master of Divinity degree from Fuller Theological Seminary. After spending several years in full-time ministry, he went back to school to earn a PhD in the history and theology of the early Christian church. He has also studied Roman history at the American Academy in Rome. Jim is currently professor of church history and historical theology at Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary at Northwestern University. When he's not teaching or performing music, he is usually traveling, taking photographs, and making pilgrimages to places like Rome and Assisi. Jim, welcome to Booked. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm very excited today to talk about your book because this is some of my favorite stuff to talk about. We're talking today about your book from Star Wars to Superman, Christ Figures in Science Fiction and Superhero Films, which might seem like an unlikely combination to some people. So can you kind of give us the, a basic overview of what your book is about, your little like 30 second elevator pitch? Sure. Well, you know, um, people love stories and people especially love stories about salvation and redemption. And we as human beings are hardwired in many ways to be receptive to the idea of a story about a savior. Uh, and I think that that's because we're made in the image of God and, and, and we're made to be ready to receive the story of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. But what that means is that many stories, even stories written long before the incarnation, have this element of a savior figure, a Christ figure in them. And this is something that resonates with the human spirit and has been for, you know, forever, for all of history. And so what this book does is it connects the popular stories about savior figures, superheroes, science fiction characters, uh, and compares them to the real Christ as we know him and, uh, and sort of analyzes, well, you know, how good of a job do these popular stories do in portraying a Christ figure? Why particularly science fiction and superhero stories? Because, like you said, we're hardwired for stories. Mm -hmm. There are lots of different kinds of stories, many genres. Um, why sci-fi and superhero? Why do you think those are particularly geared toward Christ figures in them? I think part of the reason is because uh, these are the kinds of stories that, that I resonate with and that I'm drawn to. Um, but back when I was first teaching, I was one of the early adopters of, of uh, teaching courses in religion and film. And so uh, I used to teach a course that had several components to it, different kinds of films, different kinds of, of religious analysis of, of the, the symbolism and the, the religious elements in the films. And what I found over uh, you know, different various semesters teaching this course is that students and the professor, myself, gravitated most toward these kinds of stories, the science fiction, the superhero stories, for that uh, sort of Christ element in the story and the parallels with the gospel. So one of the ways you do the comparison here I think is really unique. I haven't seen this in other books. You actually have a scoring rubric in your book yeah. um, where you're scoring the different Christ figures in these sci-fi and superhero stories and kind of comparing them to the real Christ. Right. And can you tell us about that um, scoring rubric? How did you come up with it? What are the different elements of it? Right, right. Well, you know, um, our most important doctrines as Christians, not, not just as Catholics, but as Christians, are the doctrines of the Trinity and Christology. And Christology is simply answering the question of Jesus, who do you say that I am, right? Now, the church has historically answered that question with the Nicene Creed. That is our, um, uh, our roadmap. That is our criteria for understanding Christology and the doctrine of the Trinity. So what I did was I took the elements in the Nicene Creed and I mapped them to the different superheroes and sci-fi characters to say, how do they measure up based on these things. And, you know, some of them are pretty obvious, like, does this character uh, have a, a, a moment of voluntary self-sacrifice? Does this character have a resurrection, right, of some kind? Some of them are more subtle, like, for example, um, in the Creed, you know, we say that, that Christ came down from heaven. And this idea of descent, the coming down, is very important because the real Christ started out as God, 
and became human, not the other way around. And yet so many of our superheroes or our sci-fi characters are characters who start out as human and elevate themselves to some kind of hero status, which is actually the opposite of the real Christ. And so what we find out is that, you know, some of these characters are portraying more of a heresy than, than the Orthodox or the actual Christ. So I, I use the elements in the Nicene Creed as the criteria for my Orthodoxy score, and I give them points, and the characters and the superheroes that are, that are more a, a parallel of, of the actual Christ get a higher score than, than the ones that are not. All right, so let's go through an example. And we're going to use one of my favorite sci-fis, Star Wars. Okay. okay. Let's go through Star Wars. Who's our Christ figure in that, or who's the most Christ-like, and how did you score that? Right. Well, you know, Star Wars is interesting because if you look at the whole series of films, it's almost as if multiple characters are falling all over themselves to compete for who's the Christ figure. <laughs> um, I focused in this book on the the original three films, by which I mean the ones that came out when, you know, when we were young. Episodes four, five, and six. Exactly, right. Yeah. right. And in those, I, uh, I make the case that Obi-Wan Kenobi is the primary Christ figure. And if you remember, of course, there is a moment where he sacrifices his life mm -hmm. so that the others can escape the tractor beam, right? So he's scoring high in that, in the rubric, right? We, so he has, he definitely has a, a, a voluntary self-sacrifice. And he even has a kind of a resurrection um, in the sense that, you know, we see him kind of coming back and Luke hears his voice. And so he's able to come back and give Luke advice. And so that is a kind of a resurrection. He doesn't get full points for resurrection because it's not a bodily resurrection, but he gets a few points. On the other hand, uh, you know, Obi-Wan Kenobi is not necessarily unique in the way that Jesus Christ is unique. Uh, what I mean by that is Christ is God who became human. You and I can never achieve that no matter how hard we try, right? But Obi-Wan Kenobi is the kind of hero that, you know, Luke or someone else may achieve the same level that he did through enough hard work and discipline. And so in that sense, he doesn't score very well because he's not as much like the real Christ. And, and as it turns out, um, you know, Obi-Wan Kenobi ends up with a relatively low orthodoxy score uh, for those kinds of reasons. What about uh, Wonder Woman? Can Wonder I ask you about Woman? her? Because I noticed looking at your book, really we don't have many female characters. The savior character in most so sci-fi and superhero stories is often a man. In Wonder Woman, we get a woman in there. That's right. So why is she, she scored pretty high in your rubric. She did. She scored high. And I will also say, I'll, I'll talk about Wonder Woman, but before I do, I don't want to forget to mention Lilu, uh, oh, yes. the character in The Fifth one. Element, is another uh, excellent female savior figure who scores very high. Uh, Wonder Woman is great because, you know, she has the divine element. Now, depending on how you see her origin story, and it's been changed over the years, uh, but there is a divine element. She comes down from the gods or she's one of, she's a goddess or something like that, which of course, we don't want to promote paganism, but at the same time, you know, as a character, she has a divine element where she, uh, she comes down to become one of us, but she has these two natures then, the human nature and a divine nature, which is like our Jesus. He has, he has the two natures. Uh, so, so she scores higher for that reason, and she ends up becoming, uh, having one of the higher scores. Yeah. analyzes uh, the characters in the stories um, in, in the in the movies. Uh, I thought he did a really good job going through and talking about the the different ways that you know each character in the different movies um, portrayed uh, Christ-like figures. Um, so that was that was really interesting because I've seen most of these movies. I'm probably gonna have to go back and watch them again now that I've read his book to kind of get more out of it from what he was saying, but I thought it was a, a really, he did a really good job on breaking things down and analyzing the characters. He's a novelist. He's written popular fiction. He's written children's books as well. So he's able to communicate the deepest truths uh, at, a, at an understandable level. Uh, and, uh, and that's what struck me about this book. You know, he's going through things we're familiar with. Uh, uh, 
popular fiction, popular movies, and he's um, he's seeing in them a certain uh, desire, or really uh, a certain complex of desires that will be satisfied only in Jesus Christ. He had kind of a ranking system. Um, there's a chart in the back of the book where he breaks it down based on different categories of what it embodies to be a Christ-like figure. Um, and so I think you can ap apply that to pretty much any kind of show that you watch. What Jim shows us is that uh, these substitutes really don't work uh, in, in the ancient world, and they really don't work in the modern world either. At the same time, Jim has a keen appreciation for the fictions, for the, the works of art, for the movies that are being produced that try to address those hungers. Uh, Jim loves these works, and, uh, and he's able to evaluate them in a, in a profound way, in a deep way, in a, in a Christian way. It would be good for them to kind of look at it through this kind of lens, as it were, instead of just, you know, taking it as it is. Um, I mean, a lot of the shows are really good and they're really enjoyable to watch. But when you look at it through this kind of perspective, it kind of changes the way you see it, too. Jim isn't coming at this from outside. He's not coming at, coming at it as uh, a covert enemy of popular culture. Jim appreciates popular culture. He's engaged in it. He's doing it himself as a novelist and as a writer of children's books and as a as a musician and as a songwriter and as a performer. Jim engages the, the culture in engaging ways. And people will sense that, I think, from the first page. Younger kids that are watching shows on Netflix and such um, that are science fiction based, they would, they would probably um, like this book because it would help to open their eyes as far as um, seeing how the characters are portrayed in a different way. sci-fi and superhero stories and not fantasy? Or is that, a, is that potential for a future book? <laughs> you know, it is, although I wouldn't be the person to write that book. I think someone who is really into fantasy could absolutely do that and could, could incorporate um, Lord of the Rings and some of these other things. Um, it's just not my thing, so I'm not as, as much into fantasy. And it's interesting because in, among writing circles, you probably know that sci-fi and fantasy often get lumped together. The broad speculative right. fiction, yeah. Right, and there are elements of some sci-fi that cross over into fantasy. I've seen Doctor Who do this. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not my favorite thing when they cross over more into the sort of the mystical, um, but Doctor Who also scores very high on the orthodoxy score, and he sometimes, or now she, crosses <laughs> over um, into, uh, into fantasy as well. So I think you absolutely could, or someone could write a book very much like this, incorporating uh, fantasy. So maybe this is a good time now for you to tell us a little bit about your background. Have you always been uh, the, uh, the ultimate, as you've been called, sci-fi Jesus geek? I mean, <laughs> is sci-fi something you were always into? And is it really just your love of sci-fi that led you to write this book? Or how did this all come together? Maybe give us a little bit of your yeah. background. Well, you know, I've loved sci-fi since I was a kid and I read H.G. Uh, Wells' The Time Machine, which I do talk about in the book. You know, I've, I, I fell in love with the idea of time travel and have been sort of, you know, just... Uh, you know, into all things time travel. And so I, I have always been a sci-fi fan, uh, even more so than the comic books and the superheroes. Uh, when I taught that religion in film course, I, you know, made a significant component of that course about sci-fi because it's, it is a love of mine. But, it, you know, it's a, almost kind of a, a love-hate relationship because there is a, there is a huge disappointment in sci-fi for me in what I call the Star Trek factor, which is the, this idea in, in a lot of sci-fi that 
human progress means leaving religious faith behind. Mm -hmm. That somehow humanity, as it progresses toward utopia, will outgrow religious faith. And in some sci-fi, you get this idea that God doesn't exist, but evil does. And if we can put a face on evil, it's the church and it's religion and the church is holding you back and the church is hiding something from you. And so that always frustrated me. And so I think part of also my motivation for writing this book was to call that out and critique that aspect of sci-fi as well. So there's, there's some tough love for sci-fi in this book, um, but, uh, but it is still love. Yeah. Well, yeah, I love that at the end, you kind of address that issue of the um, fact that there's this false idea that faith and science can't go hand in hand. And you, right. you go through a whole section of listing right. some of the scientists who were, you know, people yeah. of faith. Right. And I love that you address, you address that in there. So you wrote this out of your love and your frustration mm -hmm. for, for Christ and for sci-fi. And you're a busy guy as a professor and someone who's leading pilgrimages and so on, so on and, and performing music. How do you find time for the writing of, of books like this? And, and you've written others, I know, as well. Right. Well, you know, I'm the kind of person that needs big blocks of time to write. Mm -hmm. And so I really didn't start writing, uh, you know, in, in, in any serious way until my sons were older and, and then I got into a routine where I, you know, I'm teaching and I pack all of my classes into like two days a week and then three days a week I'm writing. And so that's, you know, that's what I'm doing with, the, with my time when I'm, uh, when I'm not in class. And I will usually set aside whole, a whole day at a time for writing. And, you know, and that's, uh, that's the only way I can do it. Yeah. You're a big chunk writer. I have a friend yeah. who talks about being a small chunk writer or a big chunk writer. That's right. You're That's a big right. chunk writer. And, <laughs> and, and every writer needs to figure out what he or she is in that sense. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so since you're a professor and you've taught a religion in film class, have any of your students read this book and do you get any reaction from them? Yes. Um, you know, the, the students that gravitate toward the book, of course, are the ones who are already into sci-fi and, and, and comics. And so they love it and they love the dialogue and they, they love the uh, kind of bringing the, the faith into that conversation. Um, the, the book is new enough that I haven't yet used it for any of my classes, but I will uh, the next time I teach a Christology class, this book will be one of the textbooks because, you know... That seems it, a little it, bit like cheating. You're going to make your students read your own book? <laughs> oh, I always make my students read my own books, yes. Yeah, so that's just one of the things we do. Um, but, but it's also fun that I've been hearing from other professors, from colleagues, who are saying they're going to use this book in their classes as well and because it teaches doctrine in a fun way that's accessible to people who are beginners at doctrine. Yeah. And then do they do they question you at all after like when you've had some of them read it? Do they do they question you after class or do they email you or or even argue with you maybe about some of the points you bring up? Well, you know, I have had people uh, who have read the book email me with questions out of the blue, people I've never met, and I, I love to answer those questions and, and get into an email dialogue. And I've also had people question the scores and say, well, I would give this character a higher or a lower score for these reasons. And I even say in the book that I welcome that kind of dialogue because, you know, even though I have the criteria from the Nicene Creed, how many points I give them is, is a little subjective. And so I know that, you know, this is just a starting point. So I, I invite people to argue with me over the orthodoxy scores of any particular characters um, because it just uh, generates more, more conversation. Yeah, that, that's great that you can have those kind of conversations. Yeah. Um, I'm also thinking right now of my friends who are Catholic authors. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm a member of the Catholic Writers Guild, mm -hmm. and we're seeing kind of this resurgence in Catholic novels, Catholic fiction. Mm -hmm. And I know within our guild, because I write for young adult and middle grade, mm -hmm. but I know within our guild, there's a group of authors who write sci-fi and fantasy. Uh, yeah. And they have their own little critique group. And so I'm wondering from your perspective, because you've studied so much of this, what, do you have any advice would you give them? Would you have any thoughts about what you would say to them like, okay, you're Catholic and you're writing sci-fi. What would you hope they would do with their stories? That's a great question, but it's hard to answer because it's one of those things where if you try too hard to inject the gospel in your story, it will become, it'll seem forced and it, it will seem contrived. Um, 
but yet we could argue that as, as Catholic Christians, as authors, maybe we do have some kind of a responsibility to tell stories that at least don't lead people away from Christ, right? Um, and so uh, I think it would be irresponsible for a Catholic author to write a story like, like many Star Trek kinds of stories that just sort of let people read it and then walk away assuming, yeah, people are better off without Christianity. You know, I mean, th that would be irresponsible. So it's tough to find that balance. And each author, I think, has to uh, sort of come to terms with his or her own sense of calling as to how overt they want to be with their faith. And I don't want to make any rules that are, you know, general rules for everybody. Some authors want it to be more subtle. Others want it to be more obvious. And I think that's fair because I think, I think God needs both kinds of stories out there, you know, to, to draw people in. Um, and so it's, it's almost like on a case by case basis, it's kind of, you know, it's something that each individual author has to sort of be intentional about thinking mm -hmm. through for him or herself, but not try to force it. Yeah, I think when we get in trouble when it comes across as preaching mm -hmm. is when we're forcing it. Mm -hmm. And if you come in with this definite agenda, this is the message, mm -hmm. then that's when things can seem very um, false. I, I thought there was an interesting part here where you, um, you interviewed one of the Star Trek mm -hmm. writers mm -hmm. and you asked him a bit about how intentional you thought some of that was. So first of all, as someone who is a big sci-fi fan, yeah. how fun, well, well, first of all, how did you get the interview? Let's okay. start with that. <laughs> It's an interesting story because I sent probably about 50, 55 emails to um, the actors who played the parts, their management or agents, the writers and their management or agents, and directors of, you know, the different stories that I, um, that I analyze in the book. Out of the 50 to 55 uh, inquiries that I sent, I got four responses. Of the four responses, uh, three of them were polite no's, <laughs> and one was a yes. And so it was Ron Moore who was willing to talk to me. He's a great guy, and he was so gracious to give me uh, an hour of his time on a phone interview that, uh, that I was then able to transcribe, and it's in the book. And so it was, it was a lot of fun to talk to him. And uh, he was just so great. It was, you know, like a, a fan moment for me. Yeah, that's what I was thinking yeah. as I was reading through that interview. I'm like, man, this has got to be, that would be like me talking to one of my favorite yeah. authors of children's books. Right. I mean, there'd be a huge, you know, huge fan moment. What did you take away from that interview? What do you think was your, your big two? When you put the phone down mm -hmm. afterwards, what were you kind of left with? Well, it was, you know, it was interesting to me a couple of things. Uh, some of my suspicions were confirmed that you know, that some of the things, especially in the Star Trek universe that are sort of anti-church or anti-Christian were intentional. What I didn't know before talking to him was that, you know, some of it uh, was Gene Roddenberry himself sort of laying down the law, even though some of the writers would have liked to be more, you know, positive about religious faith. Um, and then, you know, we talked about to what extent uh, are, were some of these things intentional. And there were times when he said, yeah, that is exactly what I meant to do. And there were other times when he said, you know, I never even thought about that while I was writing it. So it was just really sort of eye-opening that, you know, all of these different elements kind of fall together um, into some of these classic stories that, that we're all familiar with. Yeah. Sometimes I wonder just how much um, of whether these people are fallen away Catholics or or currently practicing a faith, whether it's Catholic or otherwise, just how much that that ingrained sense of it being the faith being part of our culture, it just naturally comes out when we're telling stories, mm -hmm. right? It, it's there. I, I think that's true, and I but I think it's also what I was saying earlier about us being hardwired for um, a, a receptivity to the incarnation and to the Trinity, and so you know I think that 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 even people who have never been believers it comes out in spite of themselves. I think that, you know, this has happened with some of the writers of the, the Doctor Who stuff who um, are uh, adamantly anti-church and yet these elements still bubble up to the surface. And, you know, you, you could ask, well, is that because they're playing to their audience and they know that they'll get an emotional re reaction uh, to their stories by doing that? Or is it subconscious and is it coming out in spite of themselves? And, you know, that is probably a little of both. But it's a story well told, and it's a story like so many of the other ones you mentioned in the book that can lead us to maybe to a better understanding of who 
Christ is because exactly. we can make that compare and contrast. Exactly. Here's where those characters are and here's where they don't live up to Christ. And this is why we're following him and not Superman or right. Obi-Wan Kenobi right. or Wonder Woman. Right, or some mirror version of ourselves, <laughs> yeah. right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. I think it's so great that you're engaging with popular culture, particularly sci-fi and superhero stories, which are so huge right now in the movies, and that it's creating conversation for people to talk about Christ. And that's step number one, right? Getting people to yeah, talk about him. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. It's been so much fun talking about this. I enjoyed talking about these stories, and thank you to all of our viewers for joining us as well. As always, happy reading. Jesus said, go out to the whole world and announce the good news. And that's what Shalom is doing, is bringing the good news of the Holy Spirit in action, renewing the face of the earth so that all people may know how good is the Lord, how beautiful is the work of salvation. Thank you, Shalom, for all you do to reach out, to lead the faith forward. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Shalom World, God's own channel.